we're going to share a little bit about this passage. And, and I want to ask you a question as we start, all right? And so here's the question that I have to ask you. Do you ever feel like you need a do-over? Do you ever feel like you need a do-over? You know, I, I feel like that a lot in my life. Have you ever completely failed at something and you just feel like you need to start over and try again? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever completely failed at something and you just need to start over and try again? (laughs) Have you ever had one of those days when just nothing seems to go right and you just need to begin again (laughs) the next day and just say, I'm starting fresh because that didn't go the way I wanted it to? Have you ever been in a relationship and y'all just love each other to death, but you end up hurting each other a lot? That's probably true for almost every marriage out there. And, and, and you just want to get past the hurt and you just want to start fresh. You know, I, some days my wife and I, uh, we just aren't clicking. It happens in marriage a lot. Um, and, and a common thing that happens is one of us will just come to the other one and say, hey, do you want to try to start over? You want to try to start over? Let's see if we can begin again. And, and sometimes that works. Sometimes it's a little easier said than done. But I just want to thank God today for the chance to begin again, the chance to start over, the chance to try another time. That is a beautiful thing about the resurrection. The chance to begin again, to start over and to try another time. You know, as I think about this past year, I imagine many of us haven't always put our best self forward. Do y'all agree with me that maybe over the last year we haven't always put our best self forward? We've been through so much. A lot of us have felt very low for a long time, and perhaps we haven't felt quite like ourselves. We've personally struggled And that's likely affected uh, the way we've treated others. Am I right in assuming that many of us could use a fresh start or a new beginning? Maybe an opportunity to do better? Am I right on that? Um, We're going to get into this a little bit because I think that we, we do have that invitation and that offer this morning. First, let me remind you about the three subplots that I've mentioned that we find in the Gospel of Mark. And, and what we find is Jesus created community by calling disciples. And so Mark really does focus a lot on Jesus' relationship to his disciples. Mark also spends a lot of time focusing on Jesus' ministry among the crowds. And the crowds were this kind of teeming mass of poor and struggling people. Majority of the world was poor and lived in poverty and suffered. And Jesus spent a lot of time among those folks. Also, A big part of Mark's gospel is Jesus' conflict with the authorities. He's always having a conflict with the authorities, the religious and political authorities. And and really, the Jewish authorities were both. They had political power and also religious power. And so at the end of Jesus' life, in these last uh, few chapters of Mark, we find all these actors in the story on the stage for the final act. And every one of them, all three of these Folks share something in common, and it's a tragic thing they share in common. But what they share in common is this. Every one of them rejected Jesus. They all rejected Jesus. Now, we should expect the authorities to reject Jesus, all right? Because Jesus challenged them over and over and over again. He didn't let up. He was very critical of the authorities, He actually went into their territory and would do these direct actions sometimes that really made them angry, disturb things, disrupt things. He really did not back down in his critique of the way they treated and hurt people. All right. We also shouldn't be surprised that the crowds eventually turned on Jesus either. Crowds can be fickle. Crowds are often swayed by popular opinion and in the way that media and power spins and manipulates things and messes with our minds. Today we see that the crowds can be easily manipulated by social media and the way that things are kind of just inserted and put it into our feeds and we believe that they are true. 
It's also just very easy to go along with the crowd, right? It's easy just to go along with what the crowd's doing. I imagine sometimes if I was there in the crowd when they chose Barabbas over Jesus, if I would have maybe just gone along with what the crowd was doing. The crowd eventually, at the end of Mark's gospel, chooses Barabbas. Um, He was likely one of the Sicarii who were known to slit throats, and they were revolutionary guys who were really going against uh, the Roman Empire. And they chose Barabbas and his way of resistance, which was violence, over Jesus' way of resistance, which was love. The authorities in the crowds rejected Jesus, but if one group was going to stick with Jesus... If one group was going to stick with him, you would think it would have been his good friends, these disciples who ministered with him and spent time with him for three whole years. You would think they would stick with Jesus up until his death. But no, they rejected him. And their rejection probably hurt Jesus the most. Just a side note that I need to say um, you know, in, in a lot of my research, these three subplots have, have been put forth. There's three subplots that we find in Mark, but there's actually a fourth subplot that's really important in Mark. And we see it at the resurrection, and we see it at many times, all the way from the beginning of the gospel, um, where uh, all the way at the beginning, all the way to the end. And this fourth subplot is this. It's the way that women respond to Jesus in the gospel. Mark holds women up in his gospel, really as examples of true leadership and discipleship. He, he truly does. Um, while the authorities and the crowds and the disciples do reject Jesus, the women, they stuck with him to the end, and they model for us what it means to be a true leader, which is a servant leader. And that's what Jesus came to do. And the women figured that out way quicker than the men did. They are a model for us what a true disciple ought to be. And so I want you to know that that fourth subplot is running through this gospel. And we need to pay attention to that. So Jesus faced so much betrayal. In his last moments, he was deeply betrayed by his friend Judas, um, which it must have been very tragic for him. Judas became kind of a mole in the group. They were likely hiding out underground at this point in Jerusalem because it was becoming very dangerous. The authorities were searching for them, and they found a mole to stick in the group, a rat named Judas, to rat them out, right, and to turn them over. And so Judas knew that they were going to the garden to pray, and so Judas led the authorities to the Garden of Gethsemane, straight to where Jesus, James, John, and Peter were all praying. Once the authorities arrived to arrest Jesus, the disciples were afraid and fearful, and they all ran away in fear and fleed, leaving Jesus all alone to face his imprisonment, his torture, and unjust trial. Peter, he didn't completely run away because he kind of followed Jesus there for a bit at a distance to see what would happen. While Jesus was being unjustly sentenced to death, Peter stood outside the courtroom by the fire. And some guards noticed Peter and knew that Peter was one of Jesus' followers. At one point, his accent gave him away because he was from up north in the country in Galilee. And his kind of rural accent kind of gave him away when being in the city of Jerusalem. And three times they questioned him, three times Peter flat out denied that he knew Jesus. He heard the rooster crow and he was reminded of what Jesus said about him denying him and tormented by his cowardice and betrayal, he cursed his life and he fled. Imagine how the disciples and Peter, who was kind of one of their leaders, felt, imagine how they felt in this dark, dark, dark moment in Jesus's life. You see, not only was their friend and mentor suffering immensely, that would have caused them incredible pain to know that Jesus was suffering and they couldn't do about it. He was about to be executed and they had profoundly let him down. So not only were they struggling with the reality that he was facing all this and they couldn't help him, but they had also let him down in that moment. 
Not only were they mortified by losing their teacher and friend, but they also felt incredible guilt and shame for not sticking with him in his darkest moments. I'm sure they questioned themselves over and over and over and over again. Other gospels tell us that after Jesus was executed on Holy Saturday, right, the disciples were fearfully hiding in a room behind a locked door paralyzed by a mix of fear and shame and embarrassment at their failures. The story of Jesus ended with the disciples fleeing and running away and Peter denying he even knew Jesus. What a sad, tragic ending, right? Well, good news for them and good news for us. The story doesn't stop there. Let me read it for you. It's it's only eight verses, so let me read the scripture for us. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they... Looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So this is our scripture for today. Um, And like I said, uh, the women are still there doing for Jesus what the men wouldn't do. They went to give Jesus that proper burial Um, that he deserved, not just being thrown into a tomb, um, but they went to give him that proper burial after the Sabbath was over. And though they entered the tomb and they saw a young man in a white robe and it scared them half to death and, and he spoke to them. And let me tell you what he said one more time. He said, don't be alarmed, he said. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. The story of discipleship isn't actually over. Though it seemed like it was over, it's not over. The young men specifically tells the women to inform the disciples who fled and Peter who denied that Jesus is waiting for them in Galilee. Everything fell apart. The whole narrative, the whole story fell apart. But Jesus offers hope that it all can be put back together. You know, um, I think Grant pointed out that why did he go to Galilee? Well, here's what I think. Galilee signals a new beginning for those who had abandoned or denied Jesus. He promises those who had failed him that he had gone before them and that grace was waiting for them in Galilee. And we can receive that promise too. Those who have failed him, Those who have suffered immensely and fallen short of what God has called us to do, those who have failed Jesus, he's telling them that I have gone before them and that grace is waiting for them in Galilee. You know, the writer of Mark clearly shows Peter, for for example, to be a traitor, to be a failure. He is not shy about his critique of Peter, but he also shows Peter to be someone who is deeply loved by Jesus. Imagine what those first readers of Mark would think. If Jesus can offer this word of grace and hope to Peter, the traitor, (laughs) then perhaps this word of grace and hope can be offered to me too. If Peter is invited to meet Jesus in Galilee for a new beginning, then maybe, 
Jesus offers the same invitation to me to go meet him and experience a new beginning. You know, since the Gospel of Mark uh, was completed uh, many, many years ago, people have been very disturbed by the ending of this Gospel. Do you all understand why people are disturbed? You know, we don't see Jesus at the end. Um, We don't see the resurrected Lord. Um, We're not sure if the women actually go and tell the disciples and Peter what the young man said. It says that they were terrified, and they didn't say a word to anyone, right? They were terrified. The gospel just ends very strangely, very abruptly. It feels very unfinished, doesn't it? Where's the happy and tidy ending that we always like to have in our stories? This abrupt and strange ending led many people, um, led some folks to add their own ending to the gospel. There's a couple of other endings that have been added. And, and they're, they're believed that those were not the original endings, but they were added later. And really what they seem to be doing is trying to add additional endings to the gospel to try to make it more acceptable. But, but isn't this what we've done ever since Jesus died and rose and went into heaven? We've been trying to add things to the gospel to try to make it more appealing and acceptable. We twist it and try to make it a little more palatable to what we want to read instead of reading the gospel for what it really is, a book about how to be radical disciples of Jesus. You know, the ending of Mark is very strange, but I think there's power in the way Mark ends his gospel. His unfinished ending signals to us that the story isn't actually over. It's not over. It's an invitation at the end of Mark's gospel for us now as readers to enter into the story and begin it maybe for the first time or restart our discipleship journey with Jesus. The gospel of Mark is what we could call a circular book, and it's pretty powerful when you think about it. So it began in Galilee with a call to follow Jesus. And everybody, these disciples and many others followed Jesus along the way. And their way eventually took them to Jerusalem. And the the story ended in tragic failure and disappointment. Yet at the end of the book, the disciples are invited to go back to Galilee, the place where it all began, and start the journey over. The story takes us back to the beginning so we can start over and go at it again. In a sense, the story, as we move through it time and time again, takes us deeper and deeper and deeper into discipleship. The only way, if we're going to see the resurrected Jesus in this story, is we've got to go back to Galilee, and we've got to find him on the way. The empty tomb matters to Mark, but what really matters to Mark is following the resurrected Jesus in our day-to-day lives, in our communities, in our families, in the places where we live and work. You know, as I've studied the Gospel of Mark the last few months, um, I felt very inspired by this book. I've read it with fresh eyes. I've, I've seen Jesus with fresh eyes. I've been inspired. I've been challenged. I'm really starting to think, what about my life needs to change? Um, I, I've been inspired to want to be a better follower of Jesus. And, and part of the way I've felt here, I felt inspiration, I felt good about it, but I've also kind of felt like, man, I've got a lot of work to do <laughs> if I'm going to be a radical disciple of Jesus. I've got so much work left to do. In a sense, I feel like Jesus is inviting me, hey, John, why don't we start this discipleship journey all over again? I hear Jesus saying to me, hey, John, you've done good. You, you've, you've been trying, and yes, you've done well, but you've also made a lot of mistakes. You've missed some things. You, you've settled into things that aren't maybe exactly my best for you. You've still got a lot to learn. So let's go back to the beginning and let's relearn again what it means to follow my way. You know, the powerful part of the way this story ends is that there is no ending to it. The story is not over. This is a signal to all who seek to follow Jesus that their story is not over. Your story is not over. Failed discipleship, messing up, it can be redeemed by grace. So have you you screwed up? 
Are you disappointed with where you're at in your life right now? Do you wish you could just start over? Do you need a do-over like I asked at the beginning? Well, the good news is there is grace. Jesus' friends really messed up. They felt like giving up. They bore the unbearable weight of guilt and shame throughout their entire bodies and existence, right? Yet Jesus invited them to a fresh start to get it right the next time. This is the power of the resurrection, that Jesus, yes, he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, but the power of the resurrection is not what happened so long ago, I don't think. It's the fact that we, too, can rise today. We, too, can rise. The power of the resurrection was for Jesus, but it's also for you. It's for me. And perhaps Jesus is calling you to rise up this morning, to take his hand, and to start again. You know, following Jesus is a hard, hard road to travel. He asks so much of us. Um, he demands a lot of us. <laughs> His way is so countercultural. It's so backwards. It's so upside down. There is rejection. There is loss. There is pain, yes. But I will tell you, there is always grace. And even in a story like Mark, where we've seen, it's a very challenging book. It makes us uncomfortable. It ends with grace. It ends with that call to go back to Galilee, find Jesus there again on the way, and let's start over. Let's get it right again. Let's get it right the next time. There's always grace for the journey. Failed discipleship can always be redeemed by grace. That's the beautiful thing that, about the way this story ends. The story is not over. Your story is not over. I have some questions. It was a very simple questions today, but I always like to give you something to reflect on to help you kind of get into this. And if you have a journal, you can write these down and reflect on them. The first one is this, just the disciples fled. Peter denied, <laughs> messed up in a terrible way. They, they messed up and they got off track and they were not on the way of Jesus. How have you failed to follow the way of Jesus in your daily life? And I say in your daily life because I want you to think about your day-to-day -day existence. How are you following Jesus or how are you not following Jesus? Lent was a time of confession and searching your heart and repentance. And now we're at Easter. So what have you been wrestling with over the last few weeks? Think about it. Where do you fit in the story? Maybe you would be one of those members of the crowd who just kind of went along with everyone else. But how have you failed to follow the way of Jesus in your day-to-day -day life? And if you had a chance to start over, what would you do differently the next time around? If you could think about, man, if I could do this differently, here's what I would want to change. Repentance is not just about saying I did something wrong. It's about turning towards Jesus once again. But here's the beautiful thing. There is an invitation from Jesus. You do have a chance to start over. So will you accept Jesus' invitation to new life and a fresh start? And, and my hope would be, your answer would be yes, and that you could come to him now, even as you're at your house or wherever you're at, and, and pray that God would, would help you and empower you through the power of the resurrection to start over and to continue and to turn towards Jesus once again. This can be the beginning of something great for you. This could be the beginning of a, a, a fresh start and a new way of living and existing in this world. Maybe you can get a little bit more on the path that Jesus has laid out for you. That's the power of the resurrection, that there is new life that's offered in Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.